Hi, this is Michael Whitwer, and you're listening to the FSF Popcast. The show that makes authors and writers wish their backspace button was more of a mute button. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt Crewman number 1974. She'll know that when she puts on the red shirt and joins the crew of the Enterprise in their struggle against Amber Grossman and her Mean Girls, that she didn't leave her family destitute and without hope, because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has her back and what's left of her Beasts and Battlements game. All right, guys, our guest today uh, is an amazing author whose books have hit and are continuing to hit the New York Times bestseller lists. And uh, we are excited to be able to talk with him today because he's written books like uh, Dungeons and Dragons, Art and Arcana. There's Lore and Legends. There's Heroes Feast, uh, which is a D&D cookbook. And there's there's another cookbook. And there's there's more D&D books. There's a lot. It just just hold on a second. We're getting there. And then he also has a, an amazing uh, uh, young adult book, uh, probably about middle grade age is what I would say. Uh, it's called Vivian Van Tassel. And that book is outstanding. I'm currently reading it. My daughter's currently reading it. And frankly, we adore the book. It's phenomenal. So uh, it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. We are proud and happy to welcome Michael Whitwer to the FSF Popcast. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you so much, Tim, Kathleen. Uh, I am proud and happy to be here. And I was really sorry to miss uh, my co-authors a, a few weeks ago when you had them on the, on the live stream. I'm sorry, I, I, I actually could not come that night, but um, I, was, I was jealous. And so that's when you and I connected, and I'm really glad to be here now. You know, they, they don't get the one-on-one -on -one attention that you do, though. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. <laughs> that's true. It was all part of my master plan. I mean, your brother did, technically, but... Kyle did. Okay, that's so true. you've Kyle. had them separately. <laughs> yeah, we've had Sam on the show a while back, uh, and then we had Kyle on the show, and we're in. I've been talking with John to try and get him to come on the show as well because he just seems to have such a wealth of information and knowledge about D and D that I'd like to pick his brain. At oh, least so. you, you could talk to John one. forever. At least you're not the yeah. last one to get the one-on-one -on -one attention. Let's go with that. <laughs> well, th well, thank you for that. I I'll still feel honored, <laughs> nonetheless. But uh, John, yeah, no, I would strongly encourage you to get to get John the show because, yeah, boy, he could he can just talk forever about any depth that you want when it, it, with regards to D and D history, game history, you name it. He's he is a he's a special person. So, but anyway, I'm glad to be here now here on this yeah, uh, absolutely this Saturday. We are absolutely. Very all right, so uh, Michael, you had a couple books come out recently, uh, both in, inside of the D and D. And if you're looking at our background, you can see the outlines of the Lore and Legends book. Uh, that is the the special edition copy of the Lore, Lore and Legends book, which is just phenomenally beautiful. That is really cool looking book. Um, and also this really super cool book right here, Vivian Van Tassel. Uh, this is awesome. The Secrets at at uh, of Midnight Lake. Like I said, I've been reading it. My daughter's been reading it. We're loving it. So. Let's start with that book. Let's talk with about Vivian Van Lake right now, uh, because Vivian that's the one Van I'm Castle. currently reading and most excited about. Um, but uh, tell us about the story about that book, how that came to be, and and all the fun stuff around it. Yeah, uh, sure, Tim. Thanks, thanks for asking. So, yeah, it's been a long year of books. I'm just gonna say it. I, I have I have limped into the finish line of this year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, so so I I did three three books over five years, and then it's been four books that came out this year. So. I, I really like it, it really Ooh. kind of everything crunched up. Oh, yeah, it was it was a hard one. So everything really crunched up this year, um, starting with uh, the Legend of Dridst book that came out, uh, which was a DK visual dictionary, the first D&D visual dictionary that came out in March. And then it should have been kind of one book after another. And, and, and I know we'll, we have a little chance to talk about a couple of them. But so, yeah, Vivian Van Tassel is a book um, I've been working on since 2020, but it's got a much, much longer history than that. Um, Okay. It came out at the end of, of August, um, and and Tim, as, as you may or may not have known, I, I'm not sure um, to what degree you know you've you've studied a lot of D and D history uh, outside of again what you've been talking about with my co-authors and with lore and legends and so forth. But so, right. um, Vivian Van Tassel is an idea I came up with in in 20, I think it was 2013 or 2014, and it was when I was writing my first book, which was a book okay. called Empire of Imagination, which was a biography right. about Gary Gygax the co-creator okay. of D&D. &D. And, um, and one thing that I found when I was writing that biography was that 
when Gary was a young a young man in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So again, that's where D and D was born. That's where Gary Gygax lived. Um, you know, Dave right. Arneson lived in in the Twin Cities, and and uh, Gary lived in in Lake Geneva. And when he was a young young man, uh, probably between ten and thirteen years old, he used to tell the story how he used to always wander around the abandoned Oakwood Sanitarium in Lake Geneva. So when Gary was a kid, so this is the 50s, right? There was literally an abandoned sanitarium on the hill. And when I say on the hill, you know, Lake Geneva is this this kind of this beautiful woodsy resort town in southern Wisconsin, southeastern right. Wisconsin. And when you drive into Lake Geneva, you you drive kind of into a bowl. You know, you, you're actually like on a higher ground and you drive into a bowl. So basically the highest point in town is kind of when you drive in. And that is what they call Catholic Hill because on one side of the hill, there's this big Catholic church. And in the old days, on the other side of the hill, there was this Oakwood Sanitarium, which was this four-story, towering, uh, Romanesque-looking building that was built around the turn of the century, built around uh, – I think it was built in 1885, actually, a little bit earlier than that. Mm-hmm. And it was this this kind of ominous-looking building. Well, so when Gary was was, he was young, this building was abandoned. It had, it, had been, it had been abandoned since the mid-20s. And I've seen pictures of it, and you almost can't believe this was a real place. But but it all of the windows were knocked out, and it was this, this like this really spooky looking building on the hill that literally perched over overlooked the town of Lake Geneva. It was pretty wild, right? So anyway, long story short, Gary used to tell this story, and so you know, a, as a as a biography, you, you try to validate anything that that your right. your subject talks about, right? So uh, I I started to look into the history of of the sanitarium in Lake Geneva. What was interesting about it is that I I ended up tripping on there was like a half dozen sanitariums in Lake Geneva. Right. And what's weird about that is Lake Geneva is a town of like eight thousand people full time. Like it, the, you know, the, the population swells in the summer, but like full time, yeah, year round, it's like eight thousand people. So I'm like, why in the world is there so many sanitariums in this tiny little town? Right. And there's yeah. actually some very, very practical reasons why this this was the case in this particular town. But I just thought it was a really interesting fact. And so one day when I had just tripped on this fact when I was writing Empire of Imagination. I felt like it hit me like a lightning bolt one morning when I was on my way into work on the train that uh, I came up with this what if scenario that was a fictional mm-hmm. scenario. And the what if became, wow, OK, so the town of Lake Geneva, the, the, the town where D&D was born, hosts all of these sanitariums. So maybe maybe there was so many sanitariums because there was people seeing delusions and the delusions they were seeing is that they would see things like bears with the faces of owls owls in the woods and they would see floating eyeballs with 10 eye stalks on the top right and, and they would see things like this and people would say well you're you know you're not you're not well you're going to be we're going to commit you to these sanitariums that's why they had so many and so again th- this is where i trip on this idea that well maybe gary wasn't writing a game based on what he imagined maybe he was writing a game based on what he saw in the environs of lake geneva right so that's what that's what led me to this idea of Vivian Van Tassel and the Secret of Midnight Lake. And of course, everything has an analog here. The game D&D in the book is Beasts and Battlements. And right. it was it was found in this town of Midnight Lake. And, you know, Vivian basically comes into town. And Tim, as you've already uh, discovered in your reading, uh, basically she uh, ends up starting to play this game Beasts of Battlements. And what she's going to start to realize is there's some really weird similarities between this game Beasts and Battlements and then some old case files that she finds from these old sanitariums. In Midnight Lake, and so uh, that's kind of where all the rubber hit the road. But uh, again, ultimately, I just wanted to really write a really fun um, kind of again middle grade novel. Think you know Harry Potter and Percy Jackson mm-hmm. and, and, and Fablehaven group uh, books like that. But a really really fun um, novel that is kind of a love letter to D and D, and you know my love of D and D history and so forth. And so it kind of includes all of that. And um, hopefully, you're enjoying it. Um, and again, so far, I've gotten really spectacular feedback on that book so far. I've been doing a lot of school yeah. tours where I've been talking about it. So it's been a lot of fun. Well, and you should be getting fantastic feedback on it. It is it is very enjoyable. And uh, if you are a Harry Potter fan, you will notice that there are a ton of Harry Potter references in this book. And so it ties in very well. Question for you, though. So Vivian goes to Mirkwood Middle School. Yeah. Is Mirkwood a tie into or a nod to Elder Scrolls? Uh, uh, no, actually, that's a great call because I know there is a Mirkwood reference in Elder Scrolls. Uh, the the Mirkwood I was actually referencing was Lord of the Rings. Now it's not a, it's not a direct tie-in. I just liked okay. the, the I liked the name and the ring of it, of course, uh, and I spell it differently than than Tolkien spells right. it, right? right? But I spell it. Yeah. I think maybe the same way. I don't remember if Elder Scrolls um, spells 
Mirkwood with MI or MU. I don't remember, but MU. That's why it I is asked. MU. Okay, so it's it's a similar yeah. spelling. There's also like a there's like a Mirkwood um, like nature area in the U.S. as well. It's spelled that way. So th- there's a few different places, but I didn't get it from Elder Scrolls, although I'm a, I'm aware of that. I became aware of it later. Um, I I was thinking more about the Tolkien reference um but again it doesn't actually yeah. have a, a tie-in other than the fact that i think it's a great name for a middle school it's great name. no it's great i just I, the more i heard it, i was like and i didn't even think of the tolkien reference honestly i was just thinking i was like i know i've heard that in a video game where have i heard that and so i did went and did a google search on it because i was like it's one of those things that's once it got into in between the ears then i couldn't get it out and i'm like i gotta i gotta look this up i gotta figure out what the issue is here where this is from and so yeah i was able to track it down i was like oh Elder Scrolls. I wonder if that's where he's from. So that's why I asked. But, but yeah, a- absolutely no. And and I just I had a lot of fun. You know, a lot of what I was thinking about with this book. You know, again, I, and I, I I you know, of course, I would say this, but it, I think it's a really really great way to introduce young people to the joys of role playing games. Right? It has kind of fun role playing game scenes mm-hmm. in it. Um, but it's it, you know the, the the part with me that that I, I thought was really that I focused on at least a lot was I was really interested in bringing the reality of. Um, I, what Vivian is going through and just the reality of maybe real monsters and things like that being in your world, right? That by itself is really disruptive. And I think sometimes what happens with middle grade fantasy and young adult fantasy is it it almost ignores the standard stuff and it kind of goes right to these really wild, elaborate plots. And I'm like, you know, like it, just imagine for a second of, you know, the, the, the reality that you know and all of a sudden something that's really literally a monster that comes out of your books or out of the screen is, is in your world. It would be a really wild thing to try to deal with. And so I, I, I'm, I'm really focused on that on, on, and Vivian trying to cope with this reality of, of possibly real monsters, you know, being in her world and, and what she has to do about it. And one of the reasons you had mentioned Harry Potter, and there are Harry Potter references in there. In fact, what the deal is, is that Vivian reads Harry Potter. She's a big fan of the Harry Potter mm-hmm. series, right? The checklist. And, the, the checklist that she keeps in her thing, right? She kind of compares herself to Harry and kind of starts to realize that her life sucks more than Harry's, which is like, well, that's that's wild. Um, but the, the, the one reason I, I gripped onto that is that I was thinking to myself, what is a way a young person might cope with the idea of the reality of, of like monsters being in your world? Well, keep in mind, there are very, very few intellectual properties that are truly ubiquitous to young people. Right. You've right. got like Star Wars. Like, if you think about how many things you can kind of name drop to a young young person, most of them, they actually won't know. Oh, you it's like Stranger Things. They're like Stranger Things. I'm not allowed to watch that. Or like, oh, it's like Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. I can't watch it. <laughs> like a lot of things that we take for granted as terms of fantasy, that, that's not available to them. Right. So how many things really are? And, and what's the median thing that most kids will know? And you start to realize the list is very, very small, and Harry Potter is one of them. So I thought it would be nice to try to tie this into something that's familiar to most young people or many, many young people. That's how Vivian that's would interpret seeing these things. Oh, when she hears about like real world spells, oh, that's like Harry Potter, right? You wouldn't think D and D. Kids don't know D and D, or it's like a twelve plus game. So that was part of my thinking around how to make it uh, relatable to younger people. Mm-hmm. No, it was very smart. That was a, a great tie-in. And as a matter of fact, when I was reading it, I thought that I was like, he was smart to to use Harry Potter. Um, because of, not only just because of the popularity of the Harry Potter series, but a bit, the attraction of, of the younger audience mm-hmm. that would, you know, be a good tie. And so, yeah, very smartly done on, uh, on that. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this book finishes up. I'm, um, yeah, that's I, all well, I'm going to say. I'm just, I'm excited about it. Well, thank you. No, I, I have to tell you, I, I feel like you're getting to uh, the place where I get most excited about where it really starts to cook and it doesn't stop until the end. So I, I really hope you enjoy it. Um, I, I can tell you, I, I hope you enjoy it at least half as much as I enjoyed writing it. I, I just, I enjoyed the heck out of this process. As someone Good. who's written a ton of nonfiction books about fictional topics, for me to actually write a true like fiction novel, I, I just, I enjoyed the heck out of it. So I really hope you enjoy it. And anyone out there that's that's interested in, uh, in again, like young adult and middle grade fantasy. I, I think it, it might be something you might enjoy. So, so one more thing about one more note about this book for anybody who's listening uh, and considering books for either themselves or their or their middle grade child. Uh, one of the things that's nice about this book, and I, I have three kids, and all my kids are older, and my my youngest, my daughter, is just turn is just about ready to turn seventeen. So, you know, we went through the middle grade child uh, age books and all these different things. And that was one of the things that attracted us to Percy Jackson books was the fact that when we read the Percy Jackson books, we actually felt like we were reading something about their age group. Mm-hmm. 
And that's one of the nice things about Vivian Van Tassel is that when I read this book, now she here's a 12 year old girl dealing with the loss of her mother, dealing with having to move out of Chicago up to, you know, uh, Midnight Lake, the area that she's not familiar with, this creepy school, all these weird things, being the new person. And I thought that for what I have read so far, that you've done a really good job identifying the, the place that she's in in her life, uh, identifying what she's going through. Because I feel like a lot of the middle grade books that I, that I would used to read with my kids, because I would read them and they would read them together, we'd read them together and all these things. I always felt like if there was anything that was in their life, it was more of like a backdrop to the story. It didn't really affect this, the, the character or what was going on. It was just like, oh, yeah, Toby lost his dad. That sucks. But anyway, here's the story. But but this is a very integrated part of who and what she is. And I think it's very good that, that they, you know, even the struggles that she has in the school with some of the people in the school and and how she reacts to them. And like she's 12. Of course, she's not going to know how to control their temper. And she's not going to know how to control these things. And anyway, just kudos for I think for nailing down that age group pretty well and, and handling that and the way that that kids talk and interact with each other. It's it seemed it feels very lifelike uh, in comparison to some of the other middle grade books I've read. Gosh, Tim, thanks so much for saying that. Honestly, you know, and, and I'm going to give props to my um, to my editor, Kara Sargent at, uh, at Aladdin, Simon & Schuster, because, you know, she was one that really helped me peel that back, you know, because it's funny, to your point, I was so interested in telling this, you know, again, that, that little lightning bolt idea I had that I came up with when mm -hmm. I was writing Empire, I was so interested in getting to that story, this idea of finding out through these case files, you know, but ultimately, she's like, this is a story about a person. And she really, it's funny, as much as I was in love, you might say, with the story, she was in love with the character. And right. so, th 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 you know, th that marriage really helped me. She would always challenge me to step back and say, what's going on with Vivian? What's going on with Vivian? You know, and that was a great lesson to me uh, to remember that these are three-dimensional people. And, and you really, really, to make it a relatable book, especially to a middle grade reader, it's all about what's going on with them. What, the, what are they feeling? What are they sensing? You know, these are, and I'm Absolutely. so, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that you, you pointed that out. And to your point, um, I love Rick Reardon. I think Percy Jackson is is absolutely dynamite. And and it's funny because one thing that I realized that he's got um, going for one of the one of the best choices he made, at least in the first Percy Jackson, making that book first person was a was a hugely um, it was such a strong choice because all of mm -hmm. a sudden you are in Percy's head and you're experiencing all these wild things, and love it's so that. easy to relate to this character. Um, even though, you know, you, you know, he's, you know, he's got a chip on his shoulder, right? You know, he's really kind of that way, but, but very few people can't relate, I think, to that character in some way or another. Right, right. So yeah, I thought about all these things as we were going forward, but again, I give a lot of props to my editor who really always challenged me to keep coming back to what's going on with Vivian, what's going on with Vivian. And so far, what we've heard so far is that, that kids are connecting with it for that very reason, uh, independent awesome. of the story, which I think is a good hook, but still it's about the character. And so thank you for that. Yeah. Awesome. That is fantastic. Now that I'm over here researching sanatoriums in Lake Geneva, because that's where my brain goes with things. I'm like, I had to look at pictures of it. That place is creepy looking. Right. Well, well, so did you find a picture by chance of it when it was abandoned or before it was abandoned? I found it from before it was abandoned. OK, I'm going to share with you a picture. Enough. You, you, no, it's it's wild. You, you can't even believe what this place looked like when it was actually like abandoned you're like wow you know it's it's the kind of thing that somebody talks about especially you know well-known people the reality is what you find when you do biography no matter who you, you deal with you tend to find that stories morph and meld over time right mm -hmm. you know the, people's memories get fuzzy or sometimes a legend starts to grow around their thing that you you do have to validate right uh in, in some way or another and so when you hear about this story, you're like, wow, was there really a, you know, was there really a sanitarium in town? And what was the deal? And, and it, for, for what it's worth, when Gary used to tell the story, he actually used to call it by the wrong name, which was, which was a complicating factor in trying to figure out what place he was talking about. He used to call it um, Oak, Oak Hill Sanitarium, which it was, is, again, one of, the, one of these little things you're trying to read between the lines at what place was he talking about. Right. So when it, once I figured it all out and then found this place and then found a, a 1950s era or 1940s era picture of it, I'm like, wow, no wonder this was such a wild experience for this young troublemaker running around town. Like one of the things you did if you were a young troublemaker is you'd you'd dare each other to go up to the Oakwood Sanitarium and wander around these abandoned. It was like an abandoned castle. So 
I will absolutely send you a follow-up picture of this. Just if you're curious, maybe you can put it in the show notes or something, but yeah, um, absolutely. it's super cool. You got to see this thing. It's super creepy. And then like finding out that the, the doctor who started it then expanded. And so that was part of the reason that there were the other sanitariums in town was that this facility wasn't big enough. And it's like, Oh man, that's just, that's a lot of creepy. That, Dr. Oscar King, right? I'm yep. testing my knowledge here, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So mm, lovely. <laughs> I have I I there's there's this morbid sense of curiosity for me with sanitariums. I actually have a replica of the New York Asylum lock, like literally over on my shelf. I have a, a replica of it. I would have to go get it. And like I've had people who be who've had issues with the why do you have things about sanitariums? They were so terrible to people. Like, yes, they were. And we learned so much from that. We learned so much about how you actually should treat people. But yeah, no, absolutely. Well, you know, and, and it's funny. It's one thing that, again, it, it takes a little bit of the, you might say it takes a little bit of the, but the intrigue out of what was the real world. Because it's funny. And I did a recent interview where somebody said, well, Mike, you said you had kind of figured out, you know, what what was the real world reason why Lake Geneva had so many sanitariums? And no, it wasn't because there was real monsters coming out of a thing. And I'll, again, I won't talk about that That'd anymore. Cool, until, though. <laughs> yeah, it's um, Lake Geneva uh, is such a fascinating town because they used to call it the Newport of the West. Mm -hmm. it, so think of it that way. It's this really Tony. Otherwise, this woodsy, beautiful fishing town, this huge 20 mile around you know, deep lake, mm -hmm. great fishing lake, woodsy area. And it attracted, think of it as kind of the country estates of all really, really wealthy families from Chicago and, and Milwaukee. They yeah. would build these mansions right there on, mm -hmm. on the lakeshore, right? And so, and I mean like families like you would know, like the Maytag family, the Schwinn right. family, the Wrigley yeah. family. These all, these all, they all had mansions on the lake. And the so- The Fisher Nut family's all up there. Yeah, the, the, there you go. So you know more than I do. Um, and so consider um, the, the, the true reason why these sanitariums were there, very likely, is these were not the kind of sanitariums that were like lock and key type of facilities. That's how I kind of spin it in, in Vivian. But again, the, the real history is these were more facilities that were almost more bed and breakfasty for people that were having like nervous disorders, fainting spells, things like that. These are like old like diagnoses they would use. So the, the, uh, the real reason is that they were like really expensive facilities that people would go that had a lot of money, actually. And, and, and it's, they had these big, you know, Victorian and Romanesque. They, they, were, they were not institutional looking buildings. They were actually very fancy Mm -hmm. buildings and so that's likely why lake geneva had a lot of these there was a lot of money there and people that, that wanted track, to get better actually. yeah right yeah, that, that, was, track, that yeah. was kind of what i was seeing too in the the one article i was just looking at very, very briefly was the it was more of a celebrity resort type sanitarium than a i can't deal with this family member institutionalize them sanitarium Yes. Yeah. No, th th that's really what it, it was. But again, so I, I took a different tack, obviously, in Vivian Van Tassel. Um, it's, it's a little bit more interesting if these are more lock and key type of mm -hmm. facilities uh, for what we were trying to accomplish, at least in that yeah, narrative. For so. sure. For sure. As, as much as I want to continue talking about your books, uh, Tim is a stinky jerk face who hasn't actually shared them yet. Um, like I, I haven't I haven't gotten my hands on them yet. And no, nope, they're mine. <laughs> I did actually get a chance to browse Heroes Feast during my last Barnes & Noble trip, but my husband has started a two-book limit claiming something about financial ruin or bankruptcy or something. <laughs> something I don't about know. that. Some silly reason pish that posh. I'm allowed to buy two books. Some pish time. posh. Yeah. But, you know, thinking about all of the books that you've done for D&D, &D, what got you into D&D &D to begin with? Yeah. Um, so my brother, who obviously you know well, you um, you've obviously had him on now a couple of times. Um, so Sam, Sam is is three years older than I am. Uh, it's just us, just us two, and uh, we're from. Uh, you might know this, but so we're from the Chicago area, uh, Glenview to be exact, mm -hmm. which is a north suburb of Chicago. And uh, when we were kids, um, what happened was there was uh, this is like the mid '80s at this point, and. There was an older kid that we knew, or to be exact, he was an older brother of some really, really good friends of ours who had a bunch of um, a late 70s and early 80s AD&D books, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, what they called it back then. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was he had uh, he had dungeon mastered the game for us and our friends a little bit periodically. Um, and he decided he was done with D&D. &D. Uh, D &D, there's a lot of reasons why people wanted to be done with D&D &D in the mid 80s. Um, 
but he was done with D&D. So he was, he was selling his books and my brother became nuts about the game and decided he wanted to buy them. So my brother bought this kid's uh, stack of, of AD&D books. And then this became the every weekend activity that we would do on sleepovers is that my brother would run us through whatever adventure he wanted to torment me and my friends with. So we were like his <laughs> guinea pigs. And we're, we're young, by the way. I'm talking like, I, I bet I'm six or seven. I bet, and, you know, he's probably nine or ten. And as Sam has pointed out, he's like, I, I can't imagine I had any idea what the hell was going on with this game. There's no way we could have been following the rules per se. But that's the fun of it is that in a weird sort of way, D&D is a game where you take these rules, which they themselves called guidelines, and you kind of interpret them whatever way you need to to make this strange narrative game work. You know there's resolution through dice. You know, so we were playing D&D, you know, as early as I can remember, pretty much. Um, and this is what we did. And so we played it throughout my childhood. We ended up getting really deep into the Star Wars role-playing game a few years later. And I know Sam's talked about that extensively. First, the original West End game that we played all the versions from there on in for, I mean, for 10 and 20 year campaigns, long campaigns. Um, so we, I just, I grew up playing role-playing games. And to answer your, your question more directly, though, Kathleen, so I, I've been into D and D since I was young, but what was interesting about the way we thought about it is is consider you know in the mid '80s you know you've probably heard the legends of the Satanic Panic and all of the all of right. the concern about about this game right and um, so the, the the idea that the game was kind of created right up the road in Lake Geneva that's only seventy miles maybe from where we lived you know it's like straight it's a straight north shot from where we lived so it was kind of a local phenomenon. And it was obviously very big in Michigan as well, as you, as you probably well mm -hmm. know. Very Midwest phenomenon, so uh, as well as Minnesota and Indiana and, and so forth. But um, the, the name Gary Gygax was on the front of all these books we grew up with. And he was this really shadowy figure because if you didn't have access to you know media or you didn't really follow the path along, one reason I got so interested in who Gary Gygax was is that when I grew up, yeah, I'd been playing role-playing games now for you know, 25, 30 years, you know, and – I, I never really thought back, who was this this Gary Gygax person that grew up right up the road and he was kind of the head of everything. And during the satanic panic, he was vilified for being this this strange hermit that, you know, <laughs> created this game that was that was dangerous to young people, at least that, so the news would have you believe. And so I had never really thought back other than the fact that I had realized how formative the game had been to me and to my imagination and um, I got really interested in who this person was that had co-created this game. And so that's how I had actually started doing my original research on that first book I wrote, Empire of Imagination. And uh, kind of the rest is history. So, again, I've been, I've been playing games and thinking about uh, role-playing games for as long as I can remember. That's awesome. So then if you had to choose and you could only play one character build for the rest of your life, what would it be? Um, I really, really like the monk uh, I really like the now. And, now the monk has changed quite a bit um, over time uh, within the game, but one thing I like about the monk character generally is I, I love characters that, fr from a combat perspective, there's there's different type of ar archetypes I'll play. You know, I like bards. I, I like a lot of different character types, but I like the monk because as the monk gets more and more advanced, assuming you survive. Um, there's more and more amazing things you can do without anything. I love the notion that you can be stripped of all of your equipment, all of your stuff, all of your weapons, um, and the monk is still fine. The monk is still fine. Uh, again, yeah, I mean, the, the original um, archetypes that they built, and again, a lot of that has followed even all the way through 5th edition, but you know, your AC continues to improve as you get as you get more and more advanced, your hit points continue to go up and all this stuff. So the monk at one point becomes this kind of uh, this wrecking ball, but he doesn't need anything, which I think is really cool. Um, so I, I've always loved monk characters um, and all time. But again, there's, but that's probably the one I, I like best. I've played a monk for a while now. I have actually not played a monk yet. I think I should, but me either. Well, you, you've also only played <laughs> one game. I'm I'm a noob, so he know, is, I'm, and I'm, we started I'm him with person. Star Wars Saga Edition. So. Oh wow! Well, I mean, I, I loved the Star Wars Saga Edition. We played a lot of Star Wars role playing. We played all these different versions. Um, Saga, my recollection is, has a lot of like customization. Like, a, there's a lot of I don't remember if it's got it has feats, right? I think Saga has feats and all yeah. kinds of different, yeah. And so Saga, one thing that's really neat about it is that at higher levels you can do un incredible things, like very cinematic things in game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one challenge with it, I'll, I will tell you that that I'll, I will maybe warn you is as the dungeon master, 
Um, I know what at really high levels, that game becomes harder and harder to manage because everyone gets so customized with like 17 things that only they can do. What ends up happening is your players end up telling you what you can do and not the other way around, right? You can't, yeah. as a dungeon master, adjudicate and know everything about every character. It's, it's actually true of a many, many role-playing games these days. Yeah. That's fair. I, yeah, yeah, we've, uh, so we've my got, what? Also nine... our, my husband, who the, who's our editor, is also our GM for the Star Wars Yeah, game. he's... He runs the game for us. He tries to kill us. We we run our we do our our show uh our we do our game once a month, the second Monday of every of every month. Uh, we start a little bit early. Uh, we usually start our live shows at seven o'clock, but we start that one at six thirty Eastern, and we usually go for about three hours and sit there and we just play and talk and laugh and um, make fun of each other. It's a good time. Uh, and laugh as John tries to kill us and has been unsuccessful what's, so far. What's really he's come, terrible, he's come danger close at least twice, though. At least twice. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, we've we've had some close calls, but we've also had some some times where it was the he thought he was going to kill us. And then it went totally backward from what he thought was going to happen, which was yeah. fantastic. <laughs> well, we that, had, that's the beauty of it. It is. It is. He, yeah. had, he had this huge elaborate fight planned out. And then this, we took down this his, big bad. His, yeah, we took down his big bad in like six turns. And I love like, that. So, the look on his face was just like, really, guys? Yeah. Really? But what he expected to be the fight for pretty much the entire session was like 20 minutes. Yeah. I, I think that happens had, uh... to DMs all the time. I actually think it, it's like the equivalent of like the Indiana Jones um, Raiders of the Lost Ark scene where he pulls out his gun and shoots the, you know, mm. like the sword. <laughs> really. It's like that equivalent, right? It's okay. like you're this DM that's been doing all this plan on this big showdown and the players all have messed time. it up for you. And that's the beauty of it. If you're, I like to think that, that good humored DMs love it when that happens in a weird sort of way. I feel like, I feel like anybody who thinks that they want to be a parent should try to DM. Totally. <laughs> Totally. It, it, it learns, it make it helps you sp set your expectations <laughs> and how the best laid plans. And, yeah. And I mean, every, every group I've ever been part of, and I don't know if it's just me or if it's just every group in general, they end up becoming this little band of murder hobos. And you have more than one kid. That's all you're dealing with. too. <laughs> Well, for what it's worth, I'm running. I, I'm running a campaign with my little ones. I, I have four little ones, so I have a three-year-old, seven, nine, and eleven. Now, my eldest, my actually, my daughter, my eleven-year-old daughter is named Vivian. Oh. Not a coincidence, yeah. And uh, different spelling than what we oh, used yeah. on Vivian Van Tassel, but um, so yeah, I, I actually run um, an old-school uh, D and D campaign with them, and That's I'm actually cool. I'm running them through uh, the sinister secret of Salt Marsh right now. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's really fun. It's really fun. One thing I, I like best is I love um, I love how creative they. Let me give an example. Like the the, the beauty of role playing again is that it gives you this chance to like solve things, right? Independent of combat, which is really fun, and independent mm -hmm. of group storytelling, it gives this these kids a chance to like solve things in this like well this role playing this imaginary context. So I remember one one of the first um, uh, modules I had ever run for my kids. It was kind of a made up. It was it wasn't D and D per se. It was something that we kind of I kind of like, kind of scrapped together. But basically, um, my daughter um, she she wanted to play as a fairy and she had fairy dust. Think like Tinkerbell type like fairy dust rules. So like you need fairy dust to fly. That was that that was the deal, right? Or at least the the according to like the Tinkerbell series they have on Disney Plus. Anyway, right. so. What was so cool about it is that I remember she um, – the idea was I had sent her into this, like, throne room where she had to, like, get some treasure that was behind the throne. It was heavily guarded, like, the king was sitting on the throne, and there was, like, two guards right in front, but right behind it, there was, like, this treasure she needed, right? Some artifact. And I remember, like, she flew in. I, I don't remember what I expected her to do, but I remember it was not what I expected. So she flew in, like, on the very top near, near the rafters of this this great throne room, which made sense. That's what I thought she would do. But then I thought what she would do is, like – like float down and like steal it and then kind of float out. And what she ended up doing was floating above it and then dropping fairy dust on the artifact to levitate it back up there. I'm like, that was that's so creative. What a <laughs> cool idea. I would have never. So it was just things like that, that I think it gives kids all of these different like tools to think a little bit differently. Um, sure. You know, and, and this stuff, you know, you can bring this to your, to your real life. So I, I think it's, it was, it was really, really fun. So I've really enjoyed role playing with little kids and yes, to your, your point, Kathleen, I think every parent should be a DM. It sets you up for failure of your plans among other things. Oh yeah. Yeah. My <laughs> husband, my husband does, um, it's hero kids. So it's a, it's a different game set, but he does that with our daughter. And then he's got hero kids in space, which is loosely star Wars based. 
that he's nice. run for her too. And that's, I mean, that's pretty easy. She's, she just turned five in September. So it's a, it's very much the, you roll your D six, he rolls a D six. Whoever has the higher number is the one who wins. Very simple concept, but that, that problem solving and the, the group story is so much fun with her. Nice. No, I, I hear that. And, and for what it's worth, by the way, Star Wars to me is just tailor-made for role-playing games. When you think about the, the movies and the chatter, the, the back and forth, the tinny chatter in the movies, like, all right, kid, we're going to go for this. Oh, oh, no, no, what about the, like, the, all of that? It plays so well into a role-playing game narrative. Um, and in fact, right. the, or the original creators of the, the, the West End version of Star Wars, I, I don't think the later modules did this, but... If you ever look back on the original West End modules they did for the Star Wars role-playing game, they used to provide a script for the players. Um, so in other words, there was like a four to six part script they would you would actually hand out to your players to start the adventure. And it usually started with one player one, whoever that you decided that was, saying, I got a bad feeling about this. Oh, come on. It's going to be fine. It's only mm -hmm. five minutes. We just have to negotiate the thing. Yeah, but what about that? Like, it was this whole, it was, it was just one page. It was a little one page script they would give you. But it felt like Star Wars. And it just brought you into this kind of really fun narrative role play experience. So yeah, a big fan of Star Wars uh, throughout all the editions. Awesome. All right. So, Michael, with your D&D &D books, now those are not are things that you have co-written with some with some other amazing co-writers. And we talked about them being on the show before. There was, There's Kyle Newman. There's John Peterson and some guy named Sam. Um, yeah, but, uh, well, yeah, whatever. You know, it's just, you know, shares the same last name, whatever. <laughs> uh, but uh, how does the writing process for you differ in a collaborative effort versus your own book? Yeah. Um... Gosh, I mean, it really is pretty different. Um, I, I have to admit, having now been through it in a couple different ways, um, you know, Tim, you you still run off and and do your own work, but there's a lot of, I guess, there's there's two big different pieces. When I think about like, you have to collaboratively come up with a plan about how you're going to attack the work. You have to be aligned on that, or you don't, you just you can't write a book together, right? Uh, sure. Now, the good news is there's a lot of modular pieces that I think people don't quite realize. When you write a book like, for example, Lauren Legends that we just finished, if you really flip through that book, one thing you you can realize right away is every call out. You know, we have a call out called the Who Is series. Who is Morden Kanan? Who is Tasha? Who is Fizban? Who is a Sarak? Whatever. We do all of these different characters that are our key D&D characters that they feature in the fifth edition. So th those are all like one page call outs that are all totally modular. Like we can all split those up and just go and write them on our own. We don't have to like worry about other people. You know, here's the thing. We all review and edit each other's work. So everyone's going to see those, but you can go split those up and, and just go off and, and write your own thing. So that's really nice. Um, it's a little bit more complicated when you're trying to piece together the whole narrative. So I'll give you an example for what we did for Art and Arcana. When we figured out what that book was supposed to be, so this this was in 2018, this was our, our big visual history of D&D &D that was covering basically the first, well, 45 years up to, you know, up to date, basically. Uh, Lore and Legends being the sequel to that, kind of the last 10 years. But when we did Art and Arcana, we came up with a methodology. We came up with a couple of things that I think really served us well, and it helped us not only tackle the project in the right way, but also help us divide it up. What we ended up doing is, firstly, we decided this isn't an art book. This is a visual history. And the reason that was an important distinction was that we realized that an art book, for better or for worse, is something that you kind of like, well, first of all, how do you even curate an art book? Like, how do you decide what should be in and out? And that's a problem with a lot of art books, I think, is people say, well, I just chose this really cool, different thing because it was cool and different. Well, that's going to be different for every person. That, that, you, that, that doesn't, that's a completely subjective way to approach it. It's fine. But what we figured out is that we need a way to curate all of this infinite art that we, 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 we've, we've got at our disposal. How do we do this? So we figured out that we were going to follow the story of the brand. And so mm -hmm. we were going to basically decide what was important for the D&D brand. Sometimes it was product. Sometimes it was some external thing that happened, uh, like the satanic panic and so other things. You know. But whatever it was, we would follow the heartbeat of the brand. And by doing that, what happens is you give yourself a mechanism by which you can now curate art. So the mm -hmm. difference between an art book and a visual history is fundamentally that a visual history is trying to tell the story of something with visuals, and it doesn't have to be art. It can be pictures of people playing the game. It can be old advertising. It can be photographs oh, of a neat, camera, yeah. right? And so that's why I think Art and Arcana really was successful. But to get to the point of that is that 
what we needed to do then is we actually needed to outline exactly what the story of the brand was over the 40 years, give or take. Mm -hmm. So we basically created a really detailed timeline about all of the important stuff that happened year to year, year to year. And then we divided up the decades. We literally said, okay, John, you're going to take decade one and Mike, you're going to take decade two and Sam's going to be decade three. We literally cut up the four decades that we were writing about and then we went off and wrote them, but we wrote them based on a collaborative timeline that was made with all of us. And so we knew what we were writing about. And then once that was written, we could edit each other's work to make sure it was smooth and it felt like a single voice. And then we could right. grab down the imagery. Then we could actually have a real conversation about curating imagery because we weren't just pie in the sky. You know, you take four different authors, you're going to have four different ideas about what should go on a given page. But when you know what right. you're talking about and you all agree on what the, the talking points are, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more clear about what you need to show. Yeah, you have a fixed perspective instead of one going this way, one going that way, one going that way. Yeah. And so we did. So to answer your question, we did the same thing for Lauren Legends. That, that's how we approached that project. Is we basically established that timeline. We divided and conquered. We we shoved it back together, and that helped us understand what we needed to show from art. Which, for the record, was even more complicated for this book because we had unlimited access to the entire Wizards archive of everything they made for Fifth Edition. That that's, oh, wow. that's a major that's a major difference because you know let, let's just say for the purpose of the conversation that's fifty thousand pieces maybe it's a hundred it was it was a gazillion pieces. Well, for Art and Arcana, one thing we did have going for us is that yes, you have this curation conversation, but there was also the conversation around rarity. You actually don't have everything when you when you, when, you, when it comes down to the archive. Like a lot of the the pieces that were the most important in D and D lore had entered the private collector community forty years ago. They were gone. Okay. And so that that project became almost as much about archaeology as it was um, curation. That is to say, if you could go find something that you've been looking for, you were going to use it because you went to a lot of trouble to find it. You know, and so there was a lot of that as well is when we were trying to find, for example, the original wraparound covers for the advanced Dungeons and Dragons books. The original native covers without any trade dress on them, without the text bubbling back. Finding those was firstly, it was a miracle that we were able to. But B, once you had found them, you had to show them their original form, you know, full spread. You had to show it that way because sure. it was just so rare and interesting. So it, it was different challenges. But again, the process was basically the same. You know, figure All out right. what you're trying to outline together and then divide and conquer. Very cool. Awesome. All right. So I know that a lot of our conversation is going to be very D&D heavy because that's what you've written the most about. Hmm. But I know that you're also a well-rounded nerd. As we all are. So what are your other fandoms? What are what else do you enjoy? Do you are you a superhero guy? Are you I mean, obviously Star Wars, but are you <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um I love Star Star Wars is probably my other big fandom. You know, if I mean, let me think this through for a second. I mean, so, you know, I might get a little bit actually I might step back a little bit from that and even say, actually, so I love middle grade fantasy. So let me just like mm-hmm. – so that covers a lot of ground. First of all, you know, if you sure. think about Fablehaven or Percy Jackson like we mm-hmm. talked about, um, I, I think Sarah J. Maas, you know, she walks on water as a writer. I think she's spectacular. Um, a lot of, you know, Throne of Glass and all, all of her – like mm-hmm. so um, I, I guess I would say I cover a lot of ground. But I, I guess what I'm getting at is I love the style of middle grade fiction. And one thing I really like about it is it's pretty straightforward. It's not trying to be overly complicated. It's pretty straightforward storytelling because you're typically they're written for younger readers, right? You're not trying to overcomplicate, but there's something, there's a, there's a beauty in that style that, um, that I, I, that I really gravitate to. So I guess from a fandom standpoint, I would start with, I, I do love middle grade fiction and, and young adult fiction. And then growing out from there, yes, Star Wars, I'm firmly in the Star Wars camp. I grew up with that. I lived and breathed Star Wars uh, and all the Lucasfilm stuff, honestly, Indiana Jones and all that that business. Uh, I, lo- I love Star Trek too. Um, I wouldn't say I'm quite as deep on Star Trek as Star Wars, but um, you know, th- a lot of this stuff really comes from my brother, to be honest with you, you know, as the younger brother of Sam, and you know how deep he is in the fandom and the geekdom oh, yeah. of the whole thing. So you can pretty much bet anything he was deep into, I was deep into because I had no choice. I mean, <laughs> we were watching those Saturday morning cartoons together, whether we liked it or not. And we were going to watch what he wanted to watch, not what I wanted to watch. So so I've been following him around for, you know, the last, whatever, 40 some years now. Um, so anything he's going to been... watch this and you're going to like it. <laughs> exactly. No, he was he was very benevolent in the whole thing. He really was. He really did care. But for better or for worse, he really got me into the things he was into because he wanted to share them. You know, honestly, he was a very 
he was a wonderful older brother and he was really interested in making sure um, that we could enjoy these things together. You know, even whether even if that was a a forced situation where I was going to sit and watch his, you know, we were going to watch Next Generation for, you know, for hours and hours on end so that that we would know it together. And it was it was it was fun. So I'm uh, I'm relatively deep on Star Trek and I really, really like Star Trek as well. Cool. Yeah, I, I love that. Right. That's just that's just how that goes with older siblings, though. Like, I have two older brothers and an older sister, and so much of the things that I got into growing up was the they were the ones who were in charge. They were the ones who had the remote, so I watched what they watched. <laughs> but, Absolutely, that's just how that goes, right? Um, but I, I got to tell you, I, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. So there's there, there was such a magic. I, some of my warmest and best memories are sitting in our kind of mildewy basement, you know, on this kind of dirty brown carpet that we had and watching this old wood panel TV we had in the basement with the wood paneled VCR right above it. It was an RCA and, um, and sitting with my brother and watching Saturday morning cartoons, you know, before my parents were up. And um, it's, it's funny, you know, looking back on it, we were being manipulated by toy companies who were making TV shows to sell their toys. Oh, yeah. But boy, did I love those shows and boy, did I love those commercials. Actually, I, I would sit and just watch, watch commercials and, and they were just so exciting to imagine how, you know, nobody really has a playset like they had in, you know, those old He-Man commercials. Like you look at the playsets these kids are playing, like they're like, they're all built out and they, they're like, you know, they have like a terrarium where they've got, you know, Moss Man coming mm-hmm. out of it. I'm like, that's not real, real, realistic, but boy, did that give you great ideas to, to help you play with your own action figures. So yeah, I, I've got really warm, fuzzy memories about kind of all that stuff. That's awesome. That's cool. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we've talked a lot about uh, your different books and and everything else, but now we need to talk about one of your books, this one here, the cookbook. Oh, this thing, the cookbook. I, I did a little uh, unboxing of video of this, and I was legitimately impressed with how beautiful this cookbook is and how well it is done, and um, you know, just the art and the imagery and and the descriptions and how to make the meals and and everything. Uh, very very cool. So my question for you, my good sir, how how did you guys stumble upon the idea of we should make a cookbook about D and D? Well, stumbles stumbles is the right word to use, I think. Um, so we, um, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you exactly how this. Is. So for for what it's worth, nobody is more surprised than me to have written not one but now two cookbooks and have a cooking show and all these things again <laughs> like i cook but i'm not like a professional chef so i believe me no one is more surprised than me that 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 we're, we're sitting here talking about about cookbooks but what a what a wonderful thing you know how this has all come about so we we stumbled the idea on, on the idea actually credit goes to um uh, to aaron Weiner from 10 speed press uh who is our publisher for these books we were finishing up Art and Arcana. Uh, this is probably in 2019, maybe early 2020. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Art and Arcana, 2018. We were finishing up Art and Arcana in 2018, and Aaron came to us. Now, Aaron at 10 Speed Press, he is the um, he's the publisher of a couple of different imprints over there. Now, 10 Speed is under Penguin Random House. Mm-hmm. He has another imprint called Clarkson Potter. And Clarkson okay. Potter is also, like 10 Speed, is known for highly graphical, really beautiful books. And one of the things they specialize in is cookbooks. And in fact, under their imprint is the Barefoot Contessa series. So oh, Aaron is the publisher, okay. yeah, of, of Ina Gardens, Art Garden. So he really knows something about cookbooks. He knows how to do this, right? So he came to us when we were wrapping up Art and Arcana, which had gone really well. We were all super pleased with it. On the publisher side, on our side, we were all super happy. We loved working together. And he said, hey, you know, I've been working with you now. You know D&D better than anybody as far as I can tell. He said, I've had this idea for a while to do a cookbook. I want to do a D&D cookbook. What do you think? We're like, well, okay, well, let's, let's, let's beat that up a little bit. Let's beat that d- idea up a little bit. And one thing we were worried about initially, which was not his idea, we were worried about, like, are we talking about one of those licensed cookbooks where they're like, oh, look, D&D hot dogs. And they put like a D and D logo, and it's just a bunch of normal food. <laughs> they just put like, and they, they come up with some you know kitschy name, and that's it. We're like, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And that wasn't just the idea. A hot dog with a D and D stamp on the it, end of it. Just... Exactly. Oh, D and D chicken fingers, just what we always wanted, right? So <laughs> we're like, we're not doing that. We're not interested. But no, no. Aaron's like, no, no. Like this would be a really high end. Like we want to really <laughs> dig deep on lore. Like what do you think? So we all got together with Aaron, and we're like, okay, what can this be? Look, what is a valuable thing that, you know, us as D&D historians and kind of lore masters, where can we add value to a piece like this? So what we, we decided was, you know what? 
they've never done a D and D source book specifically on food. What if we think of this differently? What if we think of this as yes, it's going to be a D and D cookbook. It's going to be a hundred percent in world. Nothing, no, like you know, um, uh, it's not going to be all puns and silly stuff. It's going to be like a, the real stuff that your characters eat when you play a game of D and D. It's going to be that. So it's going to be really well researched. We're going to find all of the important dishes that you eat in a D and D campaign. And we're going to, that's the stuff we're going to do. And then the photography is going to be very in world. We're going to make sure that looks really authentic. Um, and what we decided was, well, let's do this too. Let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's figure out how we can, um, let's do more research than anyone's ever done on D and D food. And let's figure out what the dining habits and the etiquette is of like halflings and elves and dwarves and this type of thing. And, and this will be basically be the, the ad hoc D and D source book for food. That's how we wanted to think of it. It was going to be the player's handbook of food, basically. And I think by thinking about it that way, it made us really drill deep on D&D lore and making sure the book really felt authentic. So I'd like to think, at least with, with the first Heroes Feast, which came out in 2020, that book, um, it, I think the market responded to it so well because there was, it was, it, I think we went to such trouble to make sure that it was really scratching the itch of people that really wanted to eat what elves in D&D eat and to figure out a way to do that. So... That book was so successful, um, it not only led to a sequel, which you're, you're holding right there, Heroes Feast Flavors of the Multiverse. Right. Um, it also led to a cooking show that that was just produced by E1 and Hasbro called Heroes Feast. It's actually based on the book, and they literally cook through dishes in this book. But um, I, again, I think it came back to the idea that what was our skill set? Where, where could we as authors add value to a book like this? So once we had figured out what we wanted to make, um, 10 Speed teamed us up with this incredible professional chef named Adam Reed, who's on America's Test Kitchen. If anyone watches cooking shows, mm -hmm. they, might, they might know him from that. He's the one that does usually test out kitchen gadgets and things like that. And, um, and so he ended up kind of coming up with a real world implementation of what we were describing as the dishes we needed. And we would go back and forth sometimes. Adam would come up with something that actually, for some reason, maybe had an ingredient that wouldn't work in this particular campaign setting. So we had to go back to him and say, Adam, you know, can we do something different? So I, I think the book was very lovingly made with a really wonderful group of, again, chefs and artists and production designers and photographers, and then us just doing our part, you know, figuring out what the what dishes we were going to use, what the lore of those dishes was, and then figuring out the background. So when we got into Heroes Feast Flavors of the Multiverse, which just came out in, in November, brand new book, um, we decided we were going to really turn up the volume on this book. So one thing was awesome is that we got some some fresh uh, thinking back into it because on the original Heroes Feast, Sam was really busy with with work. He had a lot of, of, of acting work at the time, uh, doing voiceover and whatnot. So he um, he dropped off for the first Heroes Feast. We brought him back in for this one. And he injected a lot of new creativity and ideas for this book. And so cool. for Flavors of the Multiverse, what we really wanted to do is that everything people liked about the first book, we wanted to turn up the volume on. So, for example, the food photography. We loved the food photography in the first book, but food books tend to have relatively close photography of food. I mean, it, that's the nature of it. We wanted to be able to, to back the camera out and really show you some environments. We wanted to bring D&D &D to life. So one thing we did is we rented a castle. We, we made our publisher rent a castle for this oh, cookbook cool. so that we could shoot like wider angle shots of both food and suits of armor and giant hearths and, and gargoyles on battlements. Like we wanted it, all of that to be in there. So um, we went really big on food photography. We added this super fun narrative of basically characters that are wandering around the D&D world. And that, that gave us basically the narrative foundation to figure out what areas we would feature and what food to feature. Yeah, so yeah, you're showing a picture yeah. right now of, of the battlements. Like a lot of people think that like that is like Photoshopped or it's whatever. That's all 100% legitimate photography. That is literally photographed right there on those battlements. And with those mountains in the background, that's all exactly how it looks. Um, so it was a super fun project to do. And we really just, again, we just turned up the volume on the creativity of the dishes, the places that we visit. You know, we start at the Yawning Portal, which is a very famous D&D tavern. But then we end up going into space on a spell jammer uh, to the Rock of Brawl, which is kind of this D&D meets Star Wars universe. We go to places like the Dragonlance world of Kryn. Um, so we, we really we really feature a lot of different locales. Ravenloft, which people love, which is kind of a, a horror fantasy um, campaign world. 
And uh, again, we just really wanted to go big on that book. So I, I, I'm really happy to say people that liked the first book seem to love this book. And, um, you know, we're off to the races on this. And again, the, the, the cooking show that's on every week right now on, on Freebie and Plex uh, doesn't hurt because now a lot of people are watching that and going back and seeing what's available uh, as far as these books go. You know, and, and the great thing about the, you know, so one of the things I always worry about when I see branded cookbooks and things like this, A, is what you described earlier. It's just going to be some crackpot, you know, chicken fingers and hot dog thing. Or B, it's going to have some weird ingredients that you just can't find at your every... One of the things I love about this is that I you know, I've, and I have turned through a lot of different of the, these pages on this and looking at it and going, oh man, look, like, I'm not going to lie. I'm looking at the, the Sealy Court cheese and potato soup right now, and my mouth is watering. This picture is making my mouth water for this cheese and potato soup because uh, potato soup is one of my favorite things. And I'm reading the ingredients, and I'm going, there's nothing in here that I couldn't go straight to the grocery store and pick up and take it right home and make this this afternoon, which might actually be happening now that I'm talking about it. But uh, <laughs> this looks just absolutely fantastic. The, the photography is wonderful. And like I said, the ingredients more than more importantly, there's nothing in this book where I, like I said, where I look at it and go, yeah, that's, that's just too far out of pocket. That's not, that's not something that can be done. And I think that's a, a very big feather in your guys cap is that this is something that's obtainable and reachable for the average person to be able to pick this up, go try it, make the food and have fun with their, with their D and D campaign. You know, th th thank you for pointing that out because that was, and it's a huge credit, by the way, to, you know, uh, to, to, to Chef Adam Reed as well as our editors at 10 Speed as well, because they, you know, we wanted to always make sure we try to create something a little bit different, right? Anything that you eat in the D&D world, sometimes it's just like what you might have here, right? Sometimes it literally is just the same food, right? But a lot of the things, again, especially if you're using, you know, say monster meat or whatever, it needs to, it needs to be a little bit different, right? So we try to press sure. the envelope just a little bit. But to the credit of the people we worked with, there was always a collaboration about, you know, it needs to be sourceable. It needs to be something you can go to a normal grocery store and pick up yeah. that stuff. And sometimes, sometimes we do press a little bit further feel, a field just once in a while. For example, we've got tavern crickets that are actually, it's a mix of, it's like, it's like a snack mix with crickets. That's not common. You know, that's not the everyday thing you find that book. But it was important that we once in a while do that to make sure to give you D&D &D mm -hmm. flavor, I guess pun intended. Um, but mm. also, <laughs> but also, um, again, it was super important that, that just about any grocery store you go to that you can source the ingredients to make this stuff because it's not a useful cookbook if nobody can make anything inside, to your point, Tim. Like, you have to be able to, to, be able to go and, and make this stuff. And that's what we want. And mm -hmm. what's been so fun, honestly, one of the, the, the things that I think I'm most grateful for, the fan community around these books. You know, for example, there's a huge Facebook group that's just on it's, it's the Heroes Feast Facebook group. And there's, there's a number of other ones out there where there's a big community of people that love to make these things and then photograph them and then share them back with the group. And they share, oh, cool. for example, substitutions they made in various ingredients. Oh, I took this, but I made this, you know, a vegan stew or I did this. And, and it's just so fun oh, cool. to watch this group of people collaborating and sharing their ideas and just again it's it's the nature of, of the DD community really is kind of collaborating and imagining together and and kind of riffing on each other so it's been super fun to watch um it, it's kind of taken a life of its own and i'm just really grateful to be involved that's awesome yeah. i look forward to it it is it is on my to buy list because I, I need it but i have the i have the skyrim cookbook i have the official skyrim cookbook it was gifted to me as a an anniversary gift a couple years ago and I love that. There are some really cool recipes in it, but not everything is that easily found. There were there were seasonings, there were spices I had to I had to special order because I'm like, there's no place that's gonna carry those around here. But I look forward to this even more now with the I don't necessarily have to go buy crickets. But No no, no you don't. And and for the record, anytime we give you a suggestion of something that's harder to source, it actually tells you where to get it, usually in the book. That's um, awesome. yeah, yeah. So for example, oh, you know, Mark. if you want to use this, make sure get, go get Bob's red mill, whatever. So if you can at least find where to source that or even order it online. Uh, yeah. Anytime we have something that's harder to source, we'll usually give you an idea about how to get it because again, that's the nature of it. I mean, again, to your earlier points, it's just not a useful cookbook if you can't make this stuff in it. So, right. Right. Exactly. I also Very cool. really want potato soup now too. Right. 
I looked at that picture, and, and I blame Michael now, uh, but I looked at that picture, and now all I want is potato and cheese soup. And literally, just, my mouth I is watering. I just messaged my husband with the, I'm making potato soup for dinner tonight now. Like, You know, for, for the record, the so yeah, I, the it, it's funny. I, I, must, I, I must be part Elven or something, because the Elven dishes in both books, actually, the Elven section, the first Hero's Feast, and then the, the what what's the Feywild, Feywild section of this book, which are mostly Elven dishes, mm-hmm. um, are, are most of them are most of my favorite dishes in the whole Heroes Feast collection. I also really like the halfling stuff as well. The halfling stuff's always amazing, but the Elven stuff um, always works for me. It has the right balance of like lightness and delicious, fresh flavors. Like for example, Tim, if you turn to the the picture of, for example, the Elven flatbread, it's a focaccia that's decorated with fresh veg. It's like the most delicious looking yeah, thing in the I history. I saw of the world. that actually yeah. just a minute ago when I was I was kind of jumping through sections of the book. I was like, oh. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get this one though like pretty quick I have a friend who her baby shower is next month and it's sort of hobbit themed and I've been charged been put in charge of potato soup so I'm gonna I'm gonna be making potato soup from D&D for her her hobbit-esque baby shower that's awesome (laughs) Kender stumble noodles oh my dear god you're never gonna be a skinny man but hey, no, thank you. Never... Actually, you, you you mentioned it, not me. So Kem, Kender's Stumble Noodles. So so those of you who don't know what Kender is about, uh, Kenders are like uh, Kender are like halflings on the world of Kryn, the Dragonlance world. Anyone that's ever read a Dragonlance, Tasselhoff, Burfoot is a Kender. Yeah, and so yeah, he's oh he's great, right? We look love, at that. Yeah, and he's got he's got such great spirit, Tasselhoff. So. Oh my. The, the deal with Kender Stumble Noodles, actually, um, to not give you the lore, I won't bore you with the lore, but what I'll tell you about it is that they actually, um, this was news to us as well, um, uh, actress Deborah Ann Wall just wrote a D&D adventure, uh, formerly for Wizards of the Coast, that's now on D&D Beyond, and it's a Heroes Feast branded adventure, so it's super cool, and the deal is... That if I understand it right, I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. So um, Deborah has written this wonderful adventure where you are, as far as I can tell, trying to find the ingredients to go make the world's greatest mac and cheese, which in fact is Kender Stumble Noodles. Oh, which, I um, which I guess they actually give you the recipe in at the end of the adventure. It's actually part of the the thing you buy. So it's really oh. when I see that, I'm just so I, I, like I said earlier, this thing has taken a mind of its own a little bit. Now that you know D and D is doing some Heroes Feast brand. Um, game material with people like Deborah Ann Wall, who's amazing as a dungeon master, as a as a as a, as a designer, as an author. So I'm just super excited um, to like just to see where this all goes. But Kender Stumble Stumble Noodles is the is like the dish you're trying to make, if I understand it right, in that adventure. Oh, that's awesome! This book is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I keep looking through, turning the page, going, "Oh, I'd eat that." Oh yeah, I'd eat that. Oh yeah! I de- oh my god! I definitely would eat that. <laughs> so I actually I only had one more question prepared for today, and now I totally like it, it doesn't even matter anymore. I now want to ask you, Mike. Do you how how would you explain the path that your life has taken to six year old you playing D anD D for the first time? Like, how do you go from the little kid in the outskirts of Chicago playing D anD D to somebody who is writing for it? That's a no. That's a great question. Um, so I, I'll, I'll say this. I, I will. I'll say what I think. A lot of people that are, um, a lot of people in the arts and entertainment these days. You know, well, I think we'll say something similar about D and D. Whether it's Vin Diesel or Joe Manganiello or, or any number of people that basically say, you know, D and D was kind of like their 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 training ground for imagination, right? It. Um, and by the way, I think it can go in a lot of different ways. I don't think it has to be D and D, but for whatever reason, we were playing D and D in the eighties, and it 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 helped us imagine together in a really, I don't know, positive and encouraging way that um, I guess what I would say about it is for whatever reason, it encouraged us to follow our passions and our imagination. You know, it's not silly to, to want to dream up this stuff and think about this stuff and imagine together. Um, and so again, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to attribute this as much to D and D as, as maybe more of a, of a matter that I was always following my passions or maybe more to the point I was following passions that sam had that he made me do so <laughs> so it's D or star wars or whatever but so now as an adult you know and, and as someone that you know i have a, I have a regular job um you know i, I you know I've, I've got you know kind of a regular life but i've always been really encouraged to follow my passions and i think i've been given a lot of tools through games like D and star wars and role-playing games and so forth 
And so for me, it's second nature to want to use my free time to create um, creative things. Like it's, it's just built into my thing that I have to be, I have to be using my talents to be creative, whatever that is. And I would say the same at, at the work I do. I, I'm, my regular job is I'm in marketing and I try to be as creative as I can be as there as well. But it, it's very second nature to me to want to spend my free time creating things and, and playing creative games. Um, so I guess writing about D and D just feels like an extension of all of that. It, it doesn't feel like a huge departure to your point, Kathleen. I never thought I was going to do it though. I, I did not grow up thinking I was going to be a writer. That was not really on the list. Yeah. Um, I kind of fell into it in a really organic way. I was actually in a master's program where I had to, to do a special project. I was forced into it. And for some reason it got to the top of my mind that I should do a project on the creation of D and D and Gary Gygax. That's how my first book was written. It was actually originally a, a master's thesis type project that turned into a book. So um, again, I would just point back to the fact that I think we were really encouraged to be creative and that we were, we were sharpening those tools uh, in a place like D and D. That's awesome. That's like the best. Very answer. fun. Very awesome. fun answer. All right, Michael, one final silly question. And we started asking this, and as we've been explaining to our, our guests, we used to ask a variety of different silly questions, but we started settling on this one about a, about a month ago, maybe two months ago. About two months ago. Uh, and we, yeah, and we started asking this one because Kathleen and I agreed. It's a shame that you don't get asked this question as an adult. So, Michael Whitwer, what's your favorite dinosaur? Favorite dinosaur is a brontosaurus. Oh, nice pick. That is a solid pick. Because they can look above the trees and see everything. They can see everything. That's true. So, Brontosaurus. Yeah. Solid answer. I like it. Yeah. And I love the reason for it, too. That's great. I love asking people who have kids what their favorite dinosaur is, too, because it's the, oh, yeah, no, I'm still very much in the dinosaur phase. I know dinosaurs. <laughs> I could tell you those names. Not a problem. But I had to cycle through in my head all the different dinosaurs, and I... You know, I can remember most of them, I think. I mean, mo like most of them I know. I don't know all the dinosaurs. But, um, but yeah, I had to cycle through them. Like, okay, Stegosaurus? No, it's not Stegosaurus. Uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex? No, a Raptor? No. You know, like I had to go through all of them in my head a little bit. And then I was like, oh, yeah, Brontosaurus. Because, you know, they, they take the, the bite of that, that soupy, you know, spinach-looking stuff or whatever. And they, they lift their head up above the trees and they look around. And, you know, they do Brontosaurus things. And I, I like that. I like that. They're, They're big. Cool. They very are cool. very cool. Oh, Michael, we have enjoyed this conversation so much today. Where can our viewers and our listeners go to find out more about you and your work? Thank you. Um, so uh, you can find me, uh, my website is empireofimagination.com, named after my first book. So empireofimagination.com, one word. Um, you can also find me uh, at Mike Whitwer on Twitter. Um, and uh, you can find me on Instagram at unearthedarconist. Unearthed Arcanist. Um, so I'm in a few different places. Um, and yeah, again, we've got a lot of stuff kind of, again, as I mentioned, it's been a year of a lot of books. And so there's a lot of places right now. Um, we've got a, a lot of things out right now. We've got the new Heroes Feast flavors of the multiverse. We've got Lore and Legends, which is a sequel to Art and Arcana, which again, is really a deep dive on the last 10 years and, and really how the fifth edition of D&D became such a superstar in this in this analog era we live, or this digital era we live in. Um, and then, of course, we've got Vivian Van Tassel uh, and, and The Secret of Midnight Lake, which has been a huge passion project. Um, and then we've got the Heroes Feast cooking show, yeah. which, uh, by the way, oh, good news on this. We're, I'm not doing the cooking on that. We're not doing the cooking as authors. They have real chefs like Chef Mike Harris, who's amazing, uh, and Sujata Day, who's a wonderful host. And they're the ones that really drive that thing. So Heroes Feast, uh, if you're interested in checking that out, that is currently streaming live on Freevee. Like it airs live. I mean, it's not like a live show. It airs live on Freevee uh, at 8 o'clock Central on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then it's available streaming on Plex. You can watch it on demand on Plex. So uh, cool. Heroes Feast. Yeah, it's been it's been a heck of a lot of fun this season. Awesome. I am looking forward to it. Definitely. I'm going to watch it after I watch the next part of the 60th anniversary Doctor Who special that goes up today. But that's Awesome. Awesome. Good choice. <laughs> All right. Well, we will definitely link your website and your socials so that our viewers and our listeners can find you. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by this wonderful cat that has decided he has to lay where my keyboard is. No, Trying to get him to not push like, buttons. They like keyboards. It's their jam. It's their jam. That's what they do. He's also bigger All right, guys. than the desk. <laughs> 
All right, guys, I want to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing you can do to help our show continue to grow by and help us to get more amazing guests like Michael Whitworth here today to have these great conversations and funny moments for you to be able to listen to. Now, I want to remind you, too, that we also have a Patreon page where you there are five levels of subscription from $1 to $40. And I guarantee you that you have not seen the entirety of this conversation. Some of it's going to be over on Patreon. So if you were digging this conversation, I guarantee you there's some extra snippets and bonus clips over on Patreon that you're going to want to check out. Not to mention in that $1 to $40 range, not only does that get you early access, but also gets you some really cool free merch that's just part of your subscription that you can't get anywhere else. So you're going to want to check that out over on patreon.com forward slash FSF podcast, or just click the link down below. But if for whatever reason you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. And that, of course, is Michael Whitworth's editor. While we are sure that Michael is a great and kind guy, most editors, although nice, have no issue with removing errors and issues. And if you have watched this show long enough, you know that you're, bo you're bound to find plenty of both because typically I'm the error. Kathy I'm the issue. the issue. Yeah, she's the issue. It is what it is. Uh, so send in one copy of your complaint to Michael's editor. That's all they need. They'll be able to right the wrongs and erase the issues. However, preemptively, Kathleen and I would like to lodge an apology for our many issues and errors. Maybe you can forgive and forget. It is, after all, the nice thing to do. Please don't let them delete me. No. <laughs> no disintegration. No. So, Michael, thank you so much for your time. This has been a lot of fun. And, uh, hey, guys, go check out his stuff. Like I said, we'll have links down below. And that's going to wrap us up today for the FSF Popcast. Goodbye. Copyright 2023 FSF Popcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF Popcast. The views expressed by the guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com. Original music by Jordan Michaels.